the Bible. Spelled B-I-B-L-E. There used to be a song about B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. <clears throat> if you and I was to take the word Bible, and if we was to say it's an acronym for this particular phrase, we could say that it's basic information before leaving earth. Amen? And when you stop and think about it, it's very valuable that we get the information that is recorded in the Scripture and get it down deep into our heart and our soul and know what it says, understand what it means before we leave this earth and stand in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? There is some very valuable very important information that are written in the pages of this book. Things that we definitely need to know. In fact, it's like an owner's manual. It contains information, and I want you to hear me, please. And I pray that you will understand and be open to what I'm going to share with you this morning. But it is like an owner's manual that contains information on what is acceptable or what is not acceptable to God. It contains information of what pleases or what does not please God, our Creator. It's like a textbook that you and I would get that teaches us what God's will is, helping us learn God's heart. The law that is written in these pages shows you and I, explains to you and I, points out our true need to have Jesus as our Savior, and to need the Holy Spirit as our Comforter. You know what has been amazing to my wife and I over the 40 years of being in the ministry is that time and time and time again, we have had people in counseling or people that we have been visiting with, and they will say, I wish I would give anything if I just knew God's will for my life. How many of you feel that? You just want to know God's will. And then we would ask them, do you read the Bible? Do you study the Scriptures? Well, not really. We go to church periodically. But do you catch what I'm saying? It's in here. The pages that you and I have been given that shares God's will, His true will, what is acceptable, what is unacceptable, what pleases Him, and what doesn't please Him. And every part of this book is so valuably important. And while we know, Paul says in Romans 6.14, we are not under the law, but we are under grace. The law is not our master. The law is not our authoritative ruler. And even though the law is not our master and we are under grace, the law, now listen to me, the law nonetheless is extremely valuable and very important for us to study and for us to read. To us, it helps us understand 
what sin is. It helps us understand what is sin. It helps us understand what God's standards of holiness is. It helps us understand what the mark that we are to be hitting is. Or how grace will use the knowledge of the law to instruct us, to teach us, to empower us, and help us to say no to ungodliness and worldliness. Romans chapter 7, verse 7 and 8 says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be, or God forbid, on the contrary. I would not have known what sin was, or I would not have understand what the mark, the standard is, except if it wasn't for the law. I would not have known what coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Unfortunately, sin took the opportunity through that commandment and produced in me coveting of every kind. Because apart from the law, sin is dead. Or in other words, apart from the law, you may not understand and you may not know what sin is. You may not realize what you're doing is missing the mark and the standard of God's holiness. People, please understand, I realize and I know, and we all should know, we are not under the authoritative capacity of the law. It's not our master. The law cannot save us. It does not save us. However, on the other hand, it can be used as a valuable tool, as a schoolmaster, as a school teacher to expose what is sin or what is unacceptable to God. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Because of the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Catch what he's saying. We cannot do rituals. We will not be saved because we do this and this and this and this. Or we are able to go here and there and that. That's not what it's all about. And the law will not save us. It will not justify us in God's sight. But he goes on and he says, But through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Do you know how many people in our world and in our churches across America do not know what sin is because they reject certain parts of the Bible? And when they are told or mentioned something may not be pleasing to God, their first response is, we are not under the law. We're under grace. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And it does say that, and I agree with that. But they don't go on and tell you what the next scripture in each one of those cases say. And the next one in Romans 6, 15, that we'll look at here in just a little bit, says, what then, shall we go on and sin, miss the mark, because we're not under the law? God forbid, no. And then on the part where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, the very next part of that is, except don't use that liberty for a reason to serve the flesh. And so we want to look at the purpose and the reason why it was given. The law is so valuable to us, so important in the fact that it will reveal to you God's heart. It will reveal to you God's desire. It will reveal to you God's will, His acts as well as His ways. It says Moses knew not just God's acts, but he knew his ways. The Word, the Law, the Scriptures will reveal to you 
God's ways as well as God's acts. What is acceptable and what is unacceptable, pleasing and unpleasing. But if we do, as I said earlier, only concentrate on Romans 6, 14 and ignore Romans 6, 15, we will miss what Paul is trying to say. We will miss what God is wanting you and I to know. And we will open the doors. Now listen to me. We will have the potential and we could be in danger of opening the doors in our life to give the enemy a foothold and have some authority in our life because of our actions. And I'm going to go deeper on that and explain that in just a moment. If you and I begin to ignore and reject God's law and feel that they are irrelevant to us because we are no longer under them, we could be in danger of doing things and opening our heart and not understanding what God's standards and purposes for our life really is. And in so doing, we'll in unintentionally be treating the blood of Christ with contempt. We'll be doing what Hebrews 10 talks about, where we would be trampling the blood of Christ underfoot, treating it as an unholy thing, insulting the spirit of grace, and possibly coming short of the grace of God. And also, we'll stop short and forget to over, and be overlooking what else Paul said, as I've already mentioned in Romans chapter 6 and verse 15. If we are not reading and not studying God's Word, the entirety of His Word, we won't know what is pleasing to God. Ignorance is no excuse of the law. Have you ever heard that? about our laws here in America, our laws in Oregon. If you ever gone hunting and fishing and you didn't get the regulations for hunting and fishing and you were out doing something that you shouldn't do in an area that you shouldn't do and you got picked up or stopped and you said, I'm sorry, I didn't know about that, they will tell you that ignorance is no excuse of the law. It's your responsibility to study it, read it, and find out exactly what it is there for. As a matter of fact, if you go over and look at Leviticus chapter 4, there's three or four scriptures in the book of Leviticus that says that if the common people, in fact, Leviticus chapter 4 and verse 27 is one of them. If any of the common people sins unintentionally in doing any of the things which the Lord has commanded not to be done and becomes guilty, what it's saying is that even though you may unintentionally do something and you're not aware that it's not what God pleases or what God wants, it does not relinquish you from the guilt of what you're doing. It's only through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that God extends to you mercy and will extend to you His empowerment and His grace, but He is wanting you and I to study, to read, to know, and to find out what is there. And again, the law is not our master. I am not saying that the law can save us. I'm not saying that we are under the law, but it is valuable. It is so important because it will expose what God wants in your life and what God doesn't want in your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. Paul is talking about the new covenant in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he makes a really powerful statement. He said, Who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Now catch that. He says, You are a servant of the Spirit of God. Amen? Titus says, Grace will instruct and teach you. What does grace use to instruct and teach you? 
He's going to use the Word, your owner's manual. And He's going to make you understand. He's going to help you see why you shouldn't be doing it. So go back and look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. He said He's made you adequate as a servant of a new covenant, and that is the covenant of the Spirit of the law, not the letter. The Spirit kills, but the, or excuse me, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. What is Paul saying? Paul mentions the Spirit of the law. In other words, he says, what was the reason the law was put there? What was the reason? What was the purpose? What was the Spirit behind the law? In other words, why was the law written? Why did God say, don't do this? Why did He say, come out from among them and be separate and not touch the unclean thing? Why did He say, don't do what the pagans do? Why did God tell you not to look at the wine when it's red and sparkly? Why did He say that wine is a mocker, beer is a brawler? What was the purpose behind that? What was the spirit behind that? Why did He say that? Search it out and let the spirit begin to be your master. Let the spirit of grace begin to instruct you and teach you and empower you to say no because now you understand it and you're making those decisions with the spirit of the law rather than the letter and the spirit of the law is love. Amen? You see, why does our law say do not text while you're driving? There's a reason behind it. Search it out and find out why. Can we text while we're driving down the road? Yes, we can. Will we get away with it? Yes, we may. There's a possibility you will not be seen and you will not be caught. However, if you're driving and texting and you do get caught, what happens? You pay the penalty. What happens if you are driving and texting, not paying attention, and you hit someone else? You can cause major damage to yourself and to the other individual. So, in other words, what is the law saying and why is it there when you look at the spirit behind that law that law is there to protect you amen that law is there so that you will be able to love other people and not hurt them why does the law say do not drive while intoxicated can we do it yes Are we going to survive? Possibly. Will we get caught? Maybe not. But do we take a chance in hurting someone as well as ourselves? Yes. People, look at the spirit behind God's word. What is the spirit behind God? why God says. We look at the letter and we go, whoa, that's hard. I'm not under the letter of the law. I'm under grace. We ignore the spirit behind it and we go right ahead and take a chance of hurting ourselves instead of letting God minister and share why it's written the way it is written. Matthew chapter 22 Verse 37 through 40, And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and the foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands hang the entire law 
and the prophets. What is the spirit behind the law? Love. Protection. It is God's compassion. It is God caring for you. It is God not wanting you to get hurt. God not wanting you to hurt someone else. There is a reason that God wrote down, come out from among them and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. But have you and I ever gone before God and got on our face and waited before God and said, God, why did you tell us not to do what the pagan nations are doing? Why did you tell us not to get involved in those activities when Paul says everything is permissible, even though we know it's not necessarily beneficial? Why did you write that that way? What's the spirit behind this? What's the purpose? How is this beneficial to me? And then let the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, begin to guide you. You become a servant of the new covenant, the servant of the Spirit. And let God's Spirit tell us, you know what, it's best if you don't, and here's probably the reason why. How many of you want to love God the way it tells us to love Him? In Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through. How many of you really truly want to love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind? If we want to love Him that way, people, then we need to find out what the Spirit behind the law is saying and why. We need to search it out. We need to get on our face. We need to wait instead of just setting up and rejecting and saying, whoa, I'm not under that. I don't need to pay attention to that. Find out why it was there. What's the purpose behind it? Romans 13, 8 through 10. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor. When we go back to the Old Testament and thinking that it's irrelevant for today. But yet when we go back and we begin to look and we begin to read in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, all of the things that we think are unimportant, and then we look at it in the fact of loving our neighbor as ourself. We look at the fact of loving God with all of our heart, soul, and mind and not wanting to do anything that would be unpleasing to God we might begin to hear the Spirit of God open up a brand new understanding of God's Word, helping us to see what is acceptable and really unacceptable, helping us to see what is actually blocking the enemy from from having to leave our life because we've been given him legal grounds and legal rights. Verse 10 of that chapter there in that verse in Romans says, Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your might. So why was the law written? What is the spirit behind the law? Why did God tell us to be holy? Why did God tell us to be separated? What is the purpose and the reason that God tells us not to do things? Can I take time to share with you a quick story? When I first met my wife many years ago, she wasn't my wife then, when I first met her. And I used to tell my kids, I never kissed my wife before we were married because we weren't married. So she wasn't my wife at the time. Anyway, when I first met Carol, I was in the Army Guards. I was getting ready to go to basic training in Fort Knox, Kentucky, and we didn't know exactly when. And Carol and I had not dated very long. I don't know exactly how long we had dated, for sure. And then when I got my orders to ship out and go down to Fort Knox, since we hadn't been dated very long, she went to the airport with me, and Carol lived with two other girls. And I had lived with a couple of other guys, and she was living with these two girls, and they were all excited that she was going to lose me because now she could start going out and having fun with them and partying and having a good time with those to have their, them again. And when we were sitting and waiting for the plane to come, that was back in the years when you could walk right to the gate with the individual. 
And we were at the gate waiting for the plane to come up and to start boarding. And I'll never forget that I told her, I said, you know what? I said, we haven't been dating very long and we don't have a commitment to one another. And so when I leave, you're free to date who you want to, to go where you want to go. We have no commitment. You go ahead and live your life. When I get down there and get uh, through basic going into AIT, then I'll do what I can do and I'll live my life. We made an agreement that we would both do what we wanted to do. I got on the plane and I went down to Fort Knox, Kentucky. While I was there, I began to get a letter every now and then from my wife, and then I would write her, or from Carol, I would write her one back. And in this letter, she began to share with me things that she was doing. And I couldn't understand why she was doing it. But one of the things that I found out is that she had moved out of the apartment with her two friends and had moved in with my sister. The next thing, I get a letter from my mom and dad saying, man, this girl is really a neat gal. She's coming down on the weekends and spending the weekends with me and, and, and coming out to the barn and helping me milk. Where did you find this? This gal is pretty cool. And then she would tell me other things that she was doing and other decisions that she was making. And, and because I was sitting there reading those letters and I was 2,000 miles away from home, I began to see the Spirit. Now catch me. I began to see the Spirit behind those letters. I begin to see, hey, this woman loves me and I'm not committed to her. And even though I wasn't a Christian, do you know what scripture came to my mind? That Jesus loved me while I was still a sinner. He committed his life to me. He gave everything for me. And here she was, not having a commitment from me, not wanting to go out and be with other guys, not wanting to party and do all of that stuff. And so she moved out of her place and moved in with my sister so that pressure wouldn't be there. And I began to see the Spirit behind that. And as I began to see the Spirit behind her letters, as I began to understand why she was doing what she was doing, I began to see love in that that began to create within me a hunger and a thirst and a desire to get closer to Carol. That made me want to have a greater relationship. That made me want to change. That made me want to begin to do things to please her because I began to understand the reason behind what she was doing. This is what God is wanting you and I to do is to study the letters, to study His laws, to look inside of them and see why God said for you to be careful. To look inside and to see why God wrote that down. You're not under the bondage. You're under a new covenant, the spirit of the law, which is the love of God. Why He told you to make a particular choice and why he told you to make a particular decision. And you know what? That made it so much easier for me to make decisions about a relationship. So I called her collect. Cost her $200 for me to ask her to marry me. And I asked her to marry me without giving her a wedding ring at that point in time. But do you follow what I'm saying? We call on the Lord Jesus Christ when we begin to understand the purpose. It's not bondage. It's not legalism. We are not under the law. We're under the spirit of the law. And the spirit of the law is love. We find out why it's there so that you and I can make our choices based on love for God and love for one another. And we will begin to call long distance on His dime and begin to hunger for a greater relationship. Stay with me for just a little bit here. Romans chapter 2, this is what Paul is explaining as best as I can see. For the law of the spirit of life, the love of God, 
in Christ Jesus has set you free from the legalistic part of the law of sin and death. When you see and you understand the spirit behind your choices, then are not, as I already said, your choices will not be made out of legalism. They will be made out of love for God and love for one another. While we are not under the law, we are under the spirit of the law, and that is love. Now let me share in closing this, and I hope you will understand. Some will hear it and embrace it. Some will hear portions of it and block it out because it's going to stop self from doing what self wants to do. And then others will get angry and get upset. When God told the pagan nations for the, for the Israelites not to do what the pagan nations were doing, pagan was actually a non-Jewish nation. Would have been a Gentile nation. For you and I, if he uses the terminology, the pagan nations, he would tell us it's the unbelievers. Don't do what the unbelievers are doing. And all of the pagan nations, the rituals, now catch what I'm saying, and please listen to the Spirit behind God's Word as we begin to go. The pagan nations' rituals and their activities were influenced by the God of this world. You do know, according to the Scripture, that the God of this world is Satan. Amen? He is the one that took the authority from Adam way back in the book of Genesis. Listen to what I'm saying. The rituals and the activities of the unbelievers and of the, the pagan nations are influenced by the God of this world. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 3 says, and this is not up there right now, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons or the unbelievers, the pagans of disobedience. Among them, we too formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of self, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and as a result were then by nature children of wrath, even as the unbeliever and the pagans are. So get that. Let that sink in, that their activities and their rituals was influenced by the God of this world. Now stay with me, because we're looking at why did the spirit of love say, don't do what the pagans do. And now thinking and realizing that what they were doing is being influenced by the God of this world. Consequently, most of their activities, as a result, revolved around idolatry, self-worship, body worship, worshiping the creature, as Paul talks about in Romans chapter 1, instead of the Creator. The creature that they were worshiping the most was self. The rituals and activities were involved around worshiping self, the creature, more than the Creator. Evil spirits, as we have already seen in Ephesians, is behind idolatry. Therefore, idolatry is, in essence, serving the enemy and giving him a foothold, like Paul mentions in Ephesians 4.27. He said, do not give the enemy an opportunity or a foothold. 
So idolatry, therefore, serving him is opening a door to give him the right and the authority to be in our life. Paul says not everything is beneficial, even though it may be able to do it. It may be permissible. He says not everything is beneficial, and I will not be mastered by anything. Why did Paul say that? What is the love behind the spirit that is driving Paul to write this? Why did Paul say everything could be permissible? There's freedom in liberty in Christ. Everything's permissible. But don't use that liberty for an occasion to serve the flesh. So Paul goes on and says, however, it may not be beneficial to you do it, to serve the flesh, because you don't want to be mastered by anything. Paul mentions that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12. Then he goes on and says, why is he saying that? Romans 6, 16. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey. You're either the slave of sin, in other words, you're missing the mark, the standard, resulting in death, or of obedience, resulting in righteousness, doing what is right, being justified in the eyes of God. The spirit behind the law, the spirit of love, then is exposing what is unacceptable and unpleasing to God, and in so doing, he is trying to protect us from self-worship. He's trying to protect us from idolatry and opening the door in our life to give the enemy legal right and legal authority to control and master us. People listen to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. It's out of love that God has wrote this to protect us, to keep us from getting involved in worshiping the creature and doing our own desires and our own wants the way we want it and the way we feel it should be done for our own pleasures rather than trying to find out what is acceptable or unacceptable, what is pleasing or unpleasing to God. The spirit behind the law is working to empower us by his divine unmerited favor, his grace, which is his very presence in our lives, teaching and instructing us to make our choices and to surrender out of love the members of our body in righteousness so that we will fulfill the law of loving God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and loving our neighbor as ourself and saying no to ungodliness and worldliness, to the rituals and the activities of the unbelievers that are in idolatry of self-worship. And in so doing, we will fulfill the law of love. Now, I hope I did not lose you at the railroad tracks, but that you were able to grasp, bottom line, we are not under the law. The letter of the law kills. We are under grace. We are the servants of a new covenant. That covenant is the spirit of the law, the love we go back and find out why. Basic information before leaving earth explains why we are not to be involved in the rituals and the activities. We don't want to be involved in idolatry. Because you know what's happening, people? We have people that are rejecting the law. We have people that are ignoring the law and they are involved in the activities and the rituals of the pagan world and the unbelievers because they take what Paul says literally that everything is permissible. They ignore that we are not to, to miss the mark because we're not under the law. 
But they go ahead and do that, and in so doing, they're opening their lives to the enemy, and then they're sitting back and not wondering, wondering, why can't I get victory in my life? Why can't I get victory? Why can't I get closer to God? Why can't I allow God to move in me? Why can't I hear God? Why can't I know God's will? When all the time they've opened their life. Do they love the Lord? Yes, they love the Lord. Do they believe in God? Yes, they believe in God. Are they serving God? Yes, they're serving God. But in the same way, they're ignoring what's pleasing or unpleasing. They're ignoring what's acceptable and unacceptable. And they are not paying attention. Why did God say, come out from among them and do not touch? What's the word touch? When you look in the Greek and you do a depth and a study of the word touch, it means to be intimately associated, intimately involved with the activities and the rituals of the unbelievers. When you go back and do a word search on world, what does it mean to be a friend of the world? What is friendship of the world? When you go back and begin to realize that that word friend means to be intimately associated, closely connected with. And he says that if you're closely connected with the world, the activities and the rituals of the world, you're enemies of God. Why did he say that? Because, friends, he doesn't want us to be involved in an idolatrous situation. He doesn't want us serving the creature more than the creator. And we can find that in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ because when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. He said, if there's any possible way take this cup from me take it from me if there's any other way but nonetheless he says not my will but your will be done people what is God's will what's the spirit behind the law why was the law written according to Paul it was written to expose what sin really is but do you know what if we reject and refuse to study it and look at it and pay attention we're not going to know what it is. We're not going to know how we're opening the door and giving the enemy a foothold into our life. We're just going to be sitting back and wondering, why can't I get closer to God? Why can't I hear God? Why can't I get victory in my life? It's not that God is wanting us to be in bondage. It's not that he's wanting us to be in legalistic aspect. We are not under the law. So whatever you do today, do not go out of here saying, Pastor said that I was under the law and I got to study the law and I got to do everything according to the letter of the law to be saved. That isn't what I'm saying at all. I'm saying search out the law to find out what the spirit behind it is. Then make your decisions based on love for God and love for others. That is the fulfillment of the law. Would you bow with us in prayer this morning?